Welcome everyone, uh, great to have you here for this panel on Focus Australia. I uh, don't need to introduce our speakers today because they've already had an introduction. So uh, let's get straight into it. We've got 20 minutes to talk about this topic. So uh, let's get into it. And Jamie, first question for you, uh, obviously looking at the impact of COVID-19 on Australia, on the Australian gaming industry landscape, um, what has been the, the initial impact on the industry? The, the initial impact happened very suddenly, just like COVID did. Uh, it essentially stopped all physical movement and a lot of uh, gathering of people together. So all venues or gaming venues essentially had to close up very, very quickly, ranging from casinos to pubs to clubs. And, all, and the actual operators needed to manage the closure in a very, very short period of time. How do you think they've gone about that? Do you think their response has been, uh, you know, you're impressed with what they've done and how they've gone about it? Uh, generally, uh, they've been in, in, indicative of society. It's all coped very, very quickly uh, and very well in this. Um, no one predicted that a closure would be required because of a, an epidemic, let alone a pandemic like this. Uh, yes, we'd all planned, and some of us can remember uh, Y2K and how it impacted on business, but having to do without customers for what, at the time they closed, was an indefinite period of time is quite remarkable. Uh, and the response from government has also been fairly remarkable in respect of many of the, uh, the gambling venues, particularly the physical venues, by essentially trying to assist uh, with cash flow, by essentially ceasing to impose uh, the ongoing taxes. A lot of the other uh, suppliers also assisted, as well as landlords, as the case may be. Uh, a question for both of you, really. I guess it's a question everybody around the world wants to know in their own jurisdictions. But you know, what sort of long-term and, and short-term impacts we're looking at in Australia and in the industry here? It's initially going to be a short term impact because there has been a complete loss of any revenues for a substantial period of time. Um, and uh, secondly, in the case of uh, the main casinos in Australia, they've laid off about 90% of their staff, if not more. And that's 90% in the case of uh, the star. It will take a long time to get back in an operational manner for the public to have confidence to go back to the venues and then for essentially for them to start becoming profitable again. So it's going to have a complete impact on the business, uh, but it's really confidence initially that will take some time to come back. Fred, what are your thoughts? Yes, I, I agree it's going to take some time to come back both in Australia and, and worldwide. Um, uh, people are going to have to reestablish confidence in going to venues where there are uh, many people. Uh, there is going to be uh, a period of time. It's going to be difficult for people to get to the casino from overseas. Uh, so the markets will have to take time to adapt. We've done some studies with respect to 9-11, uh, the Great Recession, and, and hurricanes in the United States, and also have been looking at Macau as well. And just for example, 9-11, uh, it took air travel three years to rebound in Las Vegas. It took the gaming industry a total of six or seven years to get back to their pre-recession uh, pre, uh, uh, numbers. So this is going to be something that takes place over time. It's going to lead to changes in the way the casinos market to their uh, various segments of players. And ultimately, ultimately, they'll get there, but it's going to be a, a long slog. Uh, what, Jamie, what about the, the changes that we we're all sort of seeing in the Australian uh, gaming industry pre-COVID? Um, what, what was happening at the time and, and what impact has COVID had on that? Well, I think uh, a couple of trends have been uh, expedited as a result of uh, COVID. I think the one that's perhaps most remarkable if, is the move from uh, terrestrial gambling to online. Um, and essentially with venues closed, people who gamble as a form of entertainment uh, have essentially moved to find that activity in another means. In Australia, obviously, that's online. And uh, what, it has, what has occurred, and this has been the real challenge for particularly terrestrial venues who do not have online activities, is that they just cannot continue 
continue to have a hold on their customers. Uh, so people have moved in respect of various online forms of activity. But coming back to, so that's a trend which really has been expedited. Um, the other trend which I think uh, uh, has something which has started and it particularly is as a result of online activity is the fact that people have a choice of going to more than one destination. Uh, for, in Australia anyway, uh, you've only got one local casino generally that you would go to. Uh, obviously, people travel uh, in respect of another other markets, but in Australia, you've only got one casino essentially in most states uh, and uh, the smaller venues, but now people will not be necessarily be as loyal. Uh, probably, uh, we'll get back to online gaming too in a little bit. Uh, quite an interesting topic to broach in Australia at the moment. But uh, Fred, a bit of a question for you. Uh, again, same question being asked around the world, but what is a casino floor going to look like in the, the post-COVID era? What can we, I mean, I'm sure we're going to see massive changes and we're already starting to in those that are opening up now, but what do we expect a casino floor to look like? Well, first of all, the casino floor has always evolved depending on different marketing conditions. Um, I think the COVID-19 uh, virus has accelerated a trend. Uh, in, in many jurisdictions around the world, and I know Australia has many slot machines in their casinos, uh, the market is changing. Millennials and Gen X aren't playing slot machines like their parents or grandparents did. So the casino floor will have to change to reflect those factors as well. And COVID-19 is likely to accelerate those changes with, with social distancing for the short term, uh, with masks and other things to keep people safe. People have to feel safe uh, if they're going to go to uh, casinos. Um, so that means that there'll have to be new offerings like esports, sports betting, um, as you mentioned earlier, online gaming, perhaps run by casinos, uh, perhaps run by third parties who, who can uh, meet uh, the standards. I know Australia does not have online gaming at the present time. So all of these things are converging at the present time and the operators that are able to adapt to these changes will be the ones who are most likely to survive. Are there, I mean, just quickly, I, I, just um, interesting thing that you said there, Fred, talking about you know, short-term and long-term changes, but are there any you know, what, what changes do you think that might actually be long lasting? I know there's going to be some short term ones, but are there any that you think will continue on for the next 10, 20 years? Well, I think the changes to the game offerings uh, will, will definitely take place because for the reasons I've set forth with the millennials and Gen X having different gambling habits than their parents and grandparents. Uh, and, and casinos around the world have adopted to change before. Uh, so in Vegas, it was a family resort 30 years ago. Now it's, uh, you know, what's, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, and now it's more of an IR destination. So the gaming industry has always changed uh, in, in around the world. Macau is becoming more of a destination resort. Um, so uh, the, the companies that can adapt to this will be the ones who, who do best under these circumstances. The, there will be changes. COVID-19 has accelerated these changes. And for the short term, again, the social distancing. But 2026, 2027, when the Japan casinos IR is open, uh, hopefully social distancing will be a thing of the past. Uh, yeah, yeah, and, and I think so far as Australia is concerned on that point, uh, uh, the, the activities of both Crown and Star in particular in respect of the construction of their new casinos is continuing. Both of them have essentially secured finance through these times to ensure that there's no slowdown in respect of the construction of um, the Brisbane Casino for uh, the Star, nor also for the new resort of uh, Crown in Sydney. Um, they are both going on time for completion and uh, certainly that's what uh, there'll be a lot of marketing activity for as soon as we uh, get through COVID. Jamie, has there been a difference uh, regarding the impact of COVID based on different sectors? Uh, at, look, at, at, absolutely. I think we've been focusing so far in respect to the impact on uh, terrestrial uh, gaming, which of course has um, been absolutely impacted by not being able to operate with one exception, and that's in connection with uh, uh, lottery sales, which are still available. And uh, because of uh, them still being available, that has not slowed down. Indeed, there's been a bit of growth. But uh, the one area where there has been uh, a lot of um, uh, data 
produced relates to the growth in respect of uh, online gambling, where it's certainly uh, at a level far greater than before COVID. And that's uh, in respect of both in respect of uh, wagering sports betting, even though uh, there's been no sports actually being capable of being conducted in Australia, like a number of other markets, but it's uh, essentially uh, can be, the sports betting operators have been able to survive to a degree because racing has continued, uh, just as in the States behind closed doors. Uh, but it's also the uh, unregulated uh, gambling activities which probably have uh, grown uh, quite substantially in this period. Uh, Jamie, actually, that's a good, good um, probably area for you to maybe just give us a bit of a background in terms of the online gaming situation in Australia, as in terms of what is legal, what isn't legal? Yes, uh, look, as, as Australia has uh, probably a fairly unusual situation in so far as uh, online uh, wagering, sports betting, racing is essentially uh, legal uh, to provide, except in respect of in play on sports online, which is prohibited, uh, except over the telephone, there's uh, a number of exceptions to the exceptions to the exceptions. Uh, so it's very complicated. But one area which is not permitted in Australia to be provided by a licensed Australian operator to Australians is in respect of online gaming. Um, and some of the data indicates that there has been a growth in the interest of Australian residents in online gaming during this period. Uh, there's been increased efforts by the regulators to essentially uh, try to uh, deter people from uh, participating in those ac activities and to stop those operators from providing services. But that's probably the one trend that has occurred in the last uh, few um, months, a couple of months. Uh, and it'll be interesting to see how long term that, that is. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I saw a study that in the space of one week in Australia, online gambling activity increased by about 67% just after shutdown. So, and as you say, sports betting is the legal form, but there's no sport in the world at the moment. So naturally, we can assume a lot of that activity has been done illegally. I just want to give a bit of a background um, of a few things I'm aware of in terms of online poker in Australia, which is, of course, among the pursuits that is not regulated or legal at the moment. But I know there is quite a bit of work going on in the background on that. I know that uh, when the STARS group bought uh, Crown Bet and William Hill, I know there's a lot of lobbying going on as part of that group in terms of getting online poker back on board. I also know there's a few uh, groups that have been talking to some politicians and we're very confident of getting online poker regulated this year until COVID happened. So I've been told that there's actually very a lot of confidence going on that online poker in Australia will be regulated by the end of 2021. So I guess we'll we'll keep track of that. Uh, what about, Jamie, in terms of New Zealand, our, Australia's nearest neighbour? Um, what, what's been the landscape over there during this period? Well, uh, New Zealand's uh, had a completely different uh, market to Australia. And terrestrial is essentially much the same in respect of uh, uh, gaming activity taking place in the casinos in respect of uh, pubs in New Zealand. But where there's been an increasing focus is in respect of on uh, how it's focused on online. Uh, the position in New Zealand traditionally has been if uh, New Zealanders can actually participate in gambling online uh, with anyone who's providing those services uh, onshore, offshore. If you're onshore, you need to have a license. Offshore, uh, that's been something which uh, uh, is legal in which people can participate and provide. Uh, that's been realised as perhaps a leakage and a necessity to uh, seek to attract funds for the benefit of New Zealand racing and sport. A regula regulatory uh, improvements have been in place for quite some time and I think we're, uh, there's already in, in place regulation in respect of uh, having uh, various recognition of the offshore uh, bookmakers, particularly in respect of having arrangements with the racing sector. And I think we'll see uh, uh, a further refinement of the laws there to essentially seek to recover revenues uh, from uh, the offshore bookmakers, both in respect of an information use charge, which is like a product fee, and also in respect of a point of consumption tax. Um, and I think we'll see some of that uh, very shortly, even indeed before the New Zealand election later this year. Uh, but they've also been looking at potentially uh, understanding how should they actually regulate online gambling. And one of the four options being considered is having a licensing regime in place, which again would make it quite different to Australia.
Uh, just moving back to Australia, and I guess you know one story that's made international headlines has been uh, Crown has gone through quite a bit in the past twelve months on a, on a number of levels. Maybe Fred, can you maybe talk a little bit about you know, what the situation has been with Crown recently and the attention that they've come under? Well, Crown, you know, is a former operator in Macau, and and they obviously operate uh, in 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 Australia, New South Wales, and and Victoria. And their practices relating to VIP play and junkets have come under intense scrutiny. In addition, uh, Melco was going to purchase an interest in Crown, and that also uh, drew scrutiny from a licensing perspective. So right now, uh, New South Wales Independent Liquor and Gaming Authority uh, launched hearings uh, relating to those two issues. Uh, AML uh, generally is viewed as, as one of the most significant uh, law enforcement and regulatory issues around the world. And recent events in Australia, both in the casino sector and the banking sector, have highlighted uh, the need for a higher level of enforcement of the anti-money laundering laws. Historically, over the years, when, when casinos were first legalized in, 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 in Australia, uh, the regulators had strict licensing standards for junkets. But over the years, those standards have been relaxed to the point where the casinos are now responsible for doing due diligence of potential junkets. Uh, we do a lot of work for governments and investigations and licensing matters. And clearly, uh, putting that burden on casinos is, is very difficult because casinos, Crown in particular, and any other casino would have a very difficult time uh, conducting a, a a a significant licensing investigation on a junket operator that wants to come in. So these hearings are are looking at the Melco issue. Melco sold their stock recently in Crown, so the Melco issue may be mooted out. But the other issues relating to AML junkets and compliance issues relating to casino licensees like Crown are still going to be open issues. And it's my understanding those hearings will continue continue uh, once things get uh, moving again in Australia and it's safe to proceed. Uh, Jamie, the, the Crown situation is a lot to unpack, but you know, what, what are your general thoughts on, on what's going on there at the moment? Yeah, look, it's it's certainly been uh, one of the most significant uh, developments in respect of gambling regulation during my uh, period of practice in Australian uh, uh, gambling law. Uh, I think there's uh, one of the aspects which I also focus on is, you know, how should casinos actually be regulated? And one of the uh, most difficult challenges faced by regulators uh, over the years is, you know, should they have prescriptive controls on the way in which gambling is regulated, or should it be more purposive and essentially say it's up to you as the operator to, to indicate to us how you ensure that the risks which need to be addressed in uh, gambling are addressed by you? Uh, and I think that's going to be very much a focus in respect of the inquiry, which will have ramifications, not just in respect of gambling regulation in Australia and you know, how gambling is regulated and indeed conducted, but potentially also outside Australia, because uh, uh, there aren't many public inquiries of this nature which are conducted, particularly in respect of uh, a high profile operator like Crown. One of the things that this inquiry is looking into is whether Crown is fit to hold a, a license in New South Wales, which essentially relates to their high roller casino at Barangaroo. Uh, have they got anything to worry about? Look, well, I, I think Jamie, it's, it's very easy yeah. to uh, essentially speculate what the possible outcomes are. We, we're, well, at the moment, they haven't heard uh, most of the evidence and they said they haven't focused on much of the activities which have been conducted by Crown, nor indeed uh, whether or not they should have uh, taken steps to address these, uh, whether there's any inappropriate conduct on the behalf of Crown. But I think we've got to keep in mind that uh, the most extreme results, which would be the loss of a license, absolutely is the most extreme result. And uh, certainly uh, it's far too soon to speculate that that's even a remotest possibility uh, that it would occur. We've got probably yeah. time no, I, for I, I, agree, I agree, Jamie. Uh, let me just say I, I agree with Jamie. There, There's a hearing that still has to develop a record. And uh, while that is an option, it's the most extreme option. But let me just backtrack and, and 
put this AML issue and VIP gaming in perspective. The AML issue from a law enforcement and gaming regulatory issue uh, perspective is the most significant issue facing the gaming industry, not only in Australia, but worldwide. As maybe you know, and, and your audience knows, uh, the Financial Action Task Force in Paris, which was set up by originally the G7 countries, monitors worldwide AML practices around the world and has adopted this risk-based system we're under. So all countries are effectively operating under the same uh, system and no country, uh, whether it be um, uh, uh, Laos, whether it be Macau uh, in, in China, uh, Australia, US, no country should benefit from not complying with these AML rules. So casinos have clearly been identified as industries with a high risk and vulnerabilities to money laundering. So I just wanna make sure everybody understands what's happening in Australia is part of a much bigger picture. Sure, uh, there's so much more I'd like to ask you guys, but uh, we are, we're out of time, but 20 minutes goes very fast. So uh, thanks Fred and uh, thanks Jamie for joining us and uh, thanks to all our viewers for, for listening.